What's going on guys? Welcome back to another video with me, Ben Rogjohn, AKA the Seattle Data Guy. Someday I will definitely get a mic stand, but for today, I'm gonna continue using the handheld mic. What we're gonna talk about today is, well, databases and data warehouses and data lakes. Because honestly, I was just working with a client and they were asking me, you know, why can't I run some things on something like a uh, Snowflake versus running other things on MongoDB. So I wanted to cover the difference between things that are OLTP or online transactional processing and things that are geared for OLAP or OLAP, uh, online analytical processing. These are two different things and you can kind of split this in between databases are generally geared for transactions, you know, things that are what we call CRUD and analytics is more on the data warehouse data lake side. But let's dig a little deeper into the differences so you can kind of know what tool is for what and when you should really be picking each of these different solutions. Let's start with databases. All right, so databases have kind of morphed a lot recently, right? For the most part, people often were referring to things like MySQL, Oracle, Postgres, when they were referring to databases. These were often also, for many cases, relational databases. If you're talking about Postgres, it's slightly different, but for the most part, people treated them like uh, relational databases or database management systems. These databases, in particular, focusing on kind of the classic uh, databases, and I'm just gonna stick with uh, MySQL, Postgres, and MSSQL, or Microsoft SQL Server, because those, in particular, were all developed to be row-based databases. That is to say that data is essentially stored as a row. And we're gonna kind of figure out that this is important because for many data warehouses, at least data warehouse specific systems, they're columnar, but more about that later. For now, all data is stored as essentially a row, especially again in classic uh, relational database management systems. This is important because when you perform CRUD operations, rows are much more efficient generally to run said operations. When you just need to insert a single row or update a single row or delete a single row, it is much more efficient to have that all stored together rather than in giant kind of columns. And these are kind of the goals of these databases. Their focus is being transaction systems. So let's say you go and buy a product from Amazon. It needs to then go update that information somewhere in a row. Now, more than likely, I wouldn't be surprised if a lot of Amazon systems aren't run on traditional databases. They might be using what is often referenced as NoSQL databases, which are still generally geared for transactions, at least in the case of MongoDB or uh, like Cassandra. Their focus is to keep apps updated. I mean, Facebook's entire backend is developed on MySQL and it still is. It's essentially the entire uh, backbone of all of Facebook as well as PHP, but that's a different story. So as you can see, databases are really about transactions and managing those efficiently because that's how these systems are developed. They're just developed to be efficient on transactions. But now you run into a problem, uh, multiple problems, honestly, when you try doing analytics on these uh, databases. It's not impossible. You can definitely uh, either pull out uh, data from these systems or just run SQL directly on production, but that's kind of scary for a lot of reasons. Uh, one, for all you know, you could be running some sort of analytical query that maybe tries to insert or update or create some separate table somewhere that could, in theory, slow down uh, said database that is for transactions. The other thing is a lot of these databases are developed in such a way that they don't always keep historical information. They might keep logs. So for example, you can use this script that I'm gonna put up here uh, to track some of the logged actions that happen inside of your Postgres instance. But for the most part, history might not always get tracked. In fact, you might have hard deletes that completely delete information. And then if you wanna analyze it, you can't. So that's where data warehouses kind of came in. And data warehouses honestly have a ton of different goals. One of their main goals is tracking historical data. But let's do more than just obviously cover that because there's so much more that they do. First, let's look at the father of data warehouses, which is Bill Inman, and look at a quote that he said in terms of how he defined what a data warehouse is. And what he defined a data warehouse is basically a subject-oriented, non-volatile, integrated, time-variant collection of data in support of management decisions. So when you see a data warehouse, one of the first things you always notice is there will be a ton of sources on a diagram that are all pushing into it. All those databases that you have, all those applications like Salesforce and so on, all of that is going into one single location. And that's part of what a data warehouse is. It's a single location that you can do all your reporting off of. Another key word from that definition was integrated, meaning that one of the goals that you try to do as you're inserting data at some point is integrate all that data so that you can connect your Salesforce data to your HR data to, you know, maybe your sales data, whatever, you know, connects in real, the real world should be connected 
in your data warehouse. That's part of the value is that you can answer questions, not just from Salesforce, but you can also answer it more broadly. You can answer questions that kind of span your different domains and you're not limited to just answering a Salesforce question, but you can take Salesforce HR, Salesforce finance or other combinations. That is another benefit of a data warehouse. It's often integrated and all these data sources can now connect to each other. Now, in some way, if you've watched my uh, video on Fangs being spoiled, I talked about this and the fact that Facebook has it great because most of their data is integrated at the app level. A lot of companies are not like that. You're gonna have to spend a ton of time integrating data. Next, and I kind of referenced this earlier, is tracking historical information. Again, most databases don't track historical information. They can, but they usually will just change to say, hey, customer has changed address. Let's get rid of the old stuff. You know, it's kind of slowing things down and let's just keep the current uh, data. The problem here is then, I always get this example, if you ask a question from an analytical purpose, hey, I wanna know how many customers we've had uh, in each state or zip code over the last five years and break it down by year. Well, if you only have information that is current to that year, you can't answer that question. You have no idea where, you know, I was last year. You just know that this year I'm wherever, New York. Okay, I'm in Denver. But the point is you can't answer it. And that's something that data warehouses are supposed to capture is historical information. You'll usually see this captured either in slowly changing dimensions, or if you've kind of got a wonky data warehouse, data lake situation, then you might just be capturing snapshots every day and kind of telling the difference between those days. But in a traditional data warehouse, you use slowly changing dimensions, which then again, give you the benefit of basically capturing the information from start to end. You know, I was in New York from 12-01 to 3-01, uh, add in the year, etc. Now let's talk about the data warehouse itself. And I've honestly gotten in a slight argument with someone I was interviewing with. I was being interviewed and they were like, what is a data warehouse? You know, explain it to me. And I honestly just focused on the design. So generally data warehouse, for a lot of them, they'll just take the snowflake or star schema model where you kind of got a fact and then dimensions around it. It always gets crazier than that. People think it's that simple. Um, things get more complex, but that's kind of the basis. And then of course, uh, this VP was like, mm, but that's not all of it, right? Like a data warehouse is also columnar. And honestly, I got into a little bit of a philosophical uh, disagreement because I've seen plenty of cases where data warehouses have been developed on non-columnar uh, databases. When I say columnar, it means the data itself is stored in columns rather than in rows. For instance, but the difference being that when you run an aggregate query and you're running it over a column, you only need to pull that data. And the metadata that stores the information of where that data lives can be stored slightly differently. So that goes into indexes, which I won't cover here, but indexes and cluster keys are basically ways that you kind of can improve the performance of uh, databases and data warehouses. So that metadata is basically storing kind of where those columns and certain bits of that information are stored. So there's a lot of benefits that you get from actually using what are data warehouse built essentially databases. But for me, since I've seen data warehouses built on Postgres and Microsoft SQL Server and perform fine, I'm not going to stick too strictly to the fact that it has to be on a columnar data warehouse. It's just not necessary for everyone. It's also usually super expensive. So if you can get away with, um, you know, using a Postgres instance and that's fine, then I think the data warehouse matters less. But if you're looking for a data warehouse specific system, you know, something like Redshift or uh, Snowflake for cloud, uh, you can also look at something like uh, Teradata or Vertica. If you're doing something more on-prem, there's, there's definitely a ton of options when it comes to like picking a more data warehouse specific system. The other thing I forgot to mention is that data warehouses are very structured. It, I referenced this earlier, right? You usually have this snowflake or star uh, schema for a lot of them. I've just seen this everywhere. There's also concepts like data vaults, but we're just gonna keep it simple here. Um, you know, snowflake, star schema. And these tables are very structured, which means that if things change, you need to then put in the effort to actually make uh, those data changes using alter statements and so on. So it's not very flexible, it's very rigid. And this can be very frustrating for a lot of people, but for most people, they look at the data warehouse as kind of the core production environment, right? You'll often go through this like raw staging um, production uh, kind of process where you take data from raw um, that you've just extracted directly um, from your sources do some cleanup, maybe do some checks, just some light checks. Then you process that in staging. Staging, you make sure that all your data types are correct. Maybe do some um, integration across your different tables, as well as you know doing some more data checks because you've manipulated data. Uh, make sure you get rid of duplicate data. Make sure you kind of add in that slowly changing dimension and then push it to production once you've kind of got the okay. 
And this would often for us be called the core data layer um, at most companies that have worked at, is you push it to this data warehouse that everyone else can kind of build off of. From there, you can build like analytical layers where you kind of join all the data, but again, for a different video. The other thing I forgot to mention about data warehouses is kind of what they're used for, which is reporting. They're often used for doing things like building dashboards or reporting. Um, yes, you might do some data science and ML modeling on it, but its original kind of usage was, again, for management decisions. So you wanted to take that data and actually, so you wanted to take that data and create uh, some sort of report or a dashboard that a manager could look at and be like, hey, here's a decision I'm gonna make off of it. So you were trying to make data accessible to not just engineers, which is you know them working with databases, but also to analysts who would then develop that data in such a way that would then be accessible by leadership. And so that's really the focus is you take this data that is not really that usable, um, or at least that easy to work with. There's tons of joins you have to do. It's, it's really kind of messy um, from a traditional database and put it into a data warehouse so that you as the end user um, can then access it easily, kind of understand it either through uh, the fact dimension model of Snowflake star schema, which is a little simpler than um, your third normal form approach, or you can add an analytical table that's kind of all the data joined together and again, make it super easy for analysts to work with. And that's the goal, make it super easy for analysts to work with to make dashboards and reports and give numbers to uh, your end user of all end users, which is some business executive making millions of dollars. In the big data uh, explosion of whatever it was, 2012, people started to need systems that were far more flexible. You know, they were like pushing data from MongoDB instances that were constantly changing because the software engineering team was changing it. And it was just like this constant mess of like trying to deal with all that. And one of the solutions that came out of all of this was like, hey, what if we just kind of stored the data in more of a file system where schema matter mattered less and can do schema on read is often what you'll hear. And then also, they figured out ways to kind of run uh, cheaper data processing across like multiple nodes, so to speak, on cheaper hardware. And this was kind of the Hadoop era when the data lake was the next big thing and everyone was kind of running for it. And that brings us obviously to data lakes. And the thing about data lakes is they're often more likely considered like folder systems where each folder often represents a table. And then often in that table, you'll have different partitions. So in a, in a folder, you might have orders and then orders, you might have the date partitioning it and then maybe further partitions um, rather than uh, a traditional table. But in each of those is some sort of broken down uh, file. It could be uh, Parquet, it could be uh, CSV. You know, I'm sure most people don't do that just because of all the problems. It could be JSON, it honestly could be anything. It could be unstructured documents. The point was how you broke it down and how you stored it in said system wasn't as rigid as it was in a data warehouse. Okay, so use cases of data lakes. They really have been used for a lot of different things. Most successfully, usually people use them for um, ML and data science work, usually to do the initial kind of uh, analysis of data before maybe bringing it into a data warehouse to see like, hey, is this worth digging into? Um, does, should we productionize this? You might also just build direct operational uh, reporting systems because you don't have to go through all the processing. So if you need to like immediately uh, push out data rather than waiting for your batch ETL jobs to run in your data warehouse, you can have this data just pulled directly, you know, very little processing, just kind of do some quick counts and then go forward from there. Generally, I don't think it's too uncommon to see people kind of take data from your databases, push them into a data lake and then process them into a data warehouse. Um, and again, and you just have different users at these levels because a data lake has um, data in such unstructured formats, you need to be slightly technical. You need to be able to write code likely to access it in many cases. Honestly, I've seen so many different combinations of data warehouses, data lakes, where people have made things work. So I'm not gonna stick uh, or push any specific methodology, but it is important to kind of understand what they do well. And the truth is none are necessarily better than the others. They really all serve different purposes. And that was honestly what I was trying to get with with my client was transaction systems were geared for transactions. That's what they do well. That's how they've been built. Analytical systems do analytics well because that's how they've literally been built from the ground up or at the very least been designed that way um, via the actual uh, logical structure. Thus, it is important to kind of understand those differences. One is for analytics, one is for transactions, and it's just really hard to make systems do both. Now, I think both Snowflake and I wouldn't be surprised if Databricks follows are trying to do that as they're trying to build this data app ecosystem. And this is not a pitch for either. It's just, it's a hard thing to do. Making a system do both or making a system try to be a jack of all trades is always a hard thing to sell. Overall, it is important to understand kind of what the differences are so you know which one to pick. With the guys, I wanna say thanks so much for watching and I'll see y'all next time. Thank you and goodbye.